Are there, Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for your goodness, for your love, especially that you have drawn our hearts to come and learn from you, from your words, from the scripture. Heavenly Father, we pray that be with our teacher. Amen. Speak through him. Amen. And we pray, Lord God, that we will be able to receive it. Amen. And we have the full meaning, even by the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, sir. All right, brothers and sisters, we are going to proceed in our studies in the book of um, Revelation. In about four weeks now, we've done the truth about God, truth about the Spirit, truth about Christ. Last week, we did truth about worship. Today, we'll be looking at truth about the truth about the church. And we'll be reading chapter 1, verses 10 to 20. The entire verses, the entire remaining verses in chapter one. And vis a vis, we'll also be reading chap Daniel chapter seven, verses nine to 14. So they are going to be going together Daniel seven, nine to 14, and Revelation one, 10 to 20. So 10 verses from Revelation and um, five verses from Daniel, making 15 verses all true. Well, before we go into what we have for today, as a way of refreshing our mind, from last week. Do we have people who want to share with us what stood out for you last week or while meditating over them over the over over them during the week? Something came up, or there's something you really want us to uh, pay particular attention to that you learned from last week. Of course, but our is not here. But then is there anyone who wants to give us a brief review from the teachings of last week? Anyone? Okay, so no one is uh, taking us back to last week. So let's proceed today. Today, we are going to be reading two, two books. So who want to read for us? Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 20. And the next person will read Daniel 7, 9 to 14. So we need two volunteers today. Who want to volunteer for us? Two people, two volunteers. I volunteer for one. Okay, Revelation 1, 10 to 20. Okay, Revelation 10 to 20 said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus. And unto Smyrna, and unto Pagamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden of the candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. And get about the path that is the waste with a golden ghetto. His head and his hair were white as wool, were white as wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were a flame, was as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto the fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shined in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that live, liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen and have the keys of hell and death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which we shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars 
are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Praise Amen. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much. I so, will read the uh, Daniel. Daniel 7, 9 to 14. Yes, sir. I watched till the throne were put in place, and the ancient of days were seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, in its will a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from him. A thousand thousand ministered to him, ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the book was open. I watched then, because of the sound of the pompous word, which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed, given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with a cloud of heaven. He came to the ancient of, ancient of days, and he brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages shall serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one, which shall not be destroyed. Be destroyed. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Baba and Sister Julie. If... On the on the on the closer look, if you look at the, the readings from Daniel and the readings from Revelation, you'll find some similarities. You'll find some words that are similar: "Son of man, dressed in uh, in cloud, white as snow, white as wool, burning fire." As it's appearing in Daniel, it's also appearing in Revelation. During the introduction of this book, I said that the book of Revelation. It's an index book. Index means that you, you go to an index to find uh, direction to the other part of the book. That's what index does. So if we discredit the book of Revelation, indirectly, we are discrediting the entire Bible because the Revelation is like the summary of the entire book. And you'll find out that since we've started just chapter one, we've been going to different parts of the Old Testament and it tallies, you know, at the beginning, we looked at uh, he who was, who is, and who is to come. It tallies with Exodus 3, right? Many things like that. Again, to, today, we are seeing chapter 1, particularly from verses 13 to 16 or to 18. It's, it's, it's like, this is Daniel, okay? That's, those are the kind of things we are going to be studying today. I'm praying to God to give us understanding like we have prayed at the beginning. Because this book requires attention, requires patience, requires the help of the Holy Spirit. Every book does, but you see why I say so now as we move on. Let's go to the very beginning, where we started from chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, verses um, 10. Started from verses 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice. Was John not always in the Spirit? How come the text says it was in the Spirit? It was always in the spirit. It was born of the spirit. It was sealed with the spirit. It's moved by the spirit. It grows in the spirit. It dies in the spirit. How come he said that? This is a way of communicating that what's about to happen here, the Holy Spirit is doing a unique work. The Holy Spirit is doing something that is beyond the ordinary. There's a special attention on the Holy Spirit here. And that's not far-fetched. We've seen a lot of that in the New Testament, right? You know, yeah, Acts chapter 4, Peter was filled with the Spirit. He was, he's always been filled with the Spirit. But that thing that he was about to do before the leaders, he was about to defend the gospel, he was endured by the Holy Spirit in a special way. You find that also in um, Acts 13, uh, I think it was Elimas, Paul was filled with the Spirit and he did something again. So that language of being filled with the Spirit is attributed to the fact that the Holy Spirit in this context is doing something unique. And we studied that last week, isn't it? That Dan, um, John was banished to the highland of Patmos. He was there alone, no companion, no friend, no associate. In fact, he was not there with the church. This is John, one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church. This is 
John, one of the three people that validated the ministry of Apostle Paul. But here is banished alone in Patmos. But at that moment, at his downwards moment, the Holy Spirit is still very active. That tells us that God is at work in all situations. In the good time and in the bad time, God is still at work. So in verses 10, John said, I was in the spirit and I had behind me a large voice like a trumpet. Verses 13 says, saying, write what you see in the book and send it to the seven churches. Now, you, do you remember the principle of seven? We opened this at the beginning when we're talking about the seven spirits of God, the seven churches in Asia. Who want to remind us about the seven principles? Does anyone want to remind us about the seven principle who want to remind us what does that mean does that mean that there are seven churches in asia what do you remember about the seven principle can i okay go ahead, Stop. Go ahead. the principle of perfection and uh, god finished creation on the sixth day rested on the seventh day the seven churches not like there are seven churches exactly but it's a uh, uh, the entire church is, is perfection, we said. Was. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, you're correct. It's complete perfection, perfect representation, perfect sampling. So verses 11 says, write what you see in the book and send it to, to, to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pagamo, and Taretra, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. The book of Revelation uses a whole lot of imageries. You will remember in chapter 13 of the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 18, when it comes to the mark of the priest, this, this, the, the book says, let him that has understanding calculate. It's not direct. So in history, man has been interpreting what could that sisters be? Who could that, who could it be? Sometimes they say it's the Pope. Sometimes they'll say it's the Emperor. Sometimes they'll say it's the Mayor. Sometimes they'll say this and that. This book requires a whole lot of, you know, patience, understanding, so, so that we don't miss the point. It uses a whole lot of images. And one of the images in this chapter one is the imagery of seven. If you go to chapter one, verses 12, the next verse, another word is being used. Another imagery is being introduced. And in verses 12, you say, then I turned to the voice that was speaking to me and turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Yeah, it's changing. It spoke about seven churches. Now, it's bringing another imagery that we really have to understand before we move on. Before we move on in this book, we must open this imagery. What does that seven golden lampstand mean? What does it mean? Does it literally mean light, candle? Is that why some churches use candle in their service, in their liturgies? Is that why some churches use light, fire? What does that word golden, seven golden lampstand mean? So, how do we explain that? How do we understand? You use the same book. You flip back, you flip down to chap verses 20, chapter 1, verses 20, Revelation 1, 20. So this book introduced a concept, an imagery, and the book also explained what this imagery mean. These are the things we'll be seeing in these three chapters we want to see, we want to study in a couple of weeks. You'll be seeing this book introducing imageries then we have to, sometimes we, we, we will be able to interpret the imagery in the chapter. Sometimes you will, you will have to look at the next one or two chapters to interpret that imageries, imagery. And sometimes we will have to look at the other part of the Bible to understand that imagery. These are, this is the, one of the uh, techniques of, of, of this book. For example, now, seven good day lampstand. Look at verses two, one, chapter 1, verses 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstand. So he wants to explain what does it mean? It's like writing statistics. It's like drawing a chart in statistics. And you use um, is a bar bar chart, bar chart. You, you, you have three standing bar, bar chart and you have a plain dotted and you have a stroked. Plane, dotted, and stroke. Then you come to a place and say, okay, that plane means people. The dotted means um, male, and the stroke means female. 
So based on the key index, the key, you come back to the chart to interpret what is the chart saying. It's similar to what is happening here. Imageries, but now let's explain what those imageries are. It said to the seven stars, they are the angels of the seven churches. The seven lampstand are the seven churches. Do you understand that? If you, we, we, we jump from verse 12, verse 12 says, Then I turned to see the voice that, that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstand. So, what does that seven golden lampstand mean? Verse 20 now told us. He said, Verse 20 says, The seven lampstand are the seven churches. So, the imagery here is referring to the churches. So we can go back to verses 12 and substitute that imagery. We can say, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and turning, I saw the seven churches. So verses 12 and verses 11 are basically saying the same thing. Verses 11 said, uh, what you see right in the book to the seven churches, then the name of the seven, seven churches were mentioned. But when you go to verses 12, it did not mention the names of the seven churches again. He mentioned seven golden lampstands. So he's substituting church for lampstand. Let's pay attention now. What does that mean? So as far as God is concerned, the church is a light. As far as the scripture is concerned, the church is supposed to be light. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lamps stand. Which means I saw seven churches being seven churches that is shining like lights. So substitutionally, the, the, the writer is calling church lights. For example, like I said, sometimes we'll be able to interpret these uh, imageries in the same chapter, sometimes we will have to use the next chapters, the next chapter one or two, to interpret this imagery. In this context of church being light, look at chapter two. This is Ephesus, chapter two, verses one to, to five or six. This is Ephesus. Ephesus had a good, a good beginning. But along the line, they, were, they became loveless. What was the warning that Jesus gave to Ephesus? Chapter one. Verses, chapter 2, verses 5, Revelation 2, 5. Remember, therefore, from where you are fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. <laughs> See, again, imagery of lampstand. The church is light. It's referred to as a lampstand bearing light. And the owner of the church told Ephesus, if you do not repent, I will come to you and quench your light. What does that mean? I will close your church. When a church is alive, when a church is existing, it's supposed to be light. It's supposed to be a shining light. As far as the spirit, see, John was his, John said, I, I was in the spirit. This is Holy Spirit revealing John, revealing to John something important about the church. This is not John, this is not just John speculating what he wants to say. This is Holy Ghost walking in John, and what Holy Ghost referred to as church is light, not darkness. The church of Christ is light to a dark world. And you could see what Jesus said to Ephesus. If you do not repent, I will take out your light. Meaning, when the light is taken out, the church is gone. When the light is extinguished, when the Holy Spirit, when Jesus removes the light of Ephesus, Ephesus does not exist again. Can a church, can a church be on head and they bear the name church? Legally, they are registered with the government. But still, the light is out. Is that possible? Let me ask this question. Who wants to answer me? Is it possible to have a church emblem, umbrella, church denomination? People are gathered. They have structures, organization. They have membership. They have money. They are registered with the government. It's a legal entity, but the light is out. Is it possible? Who wants to answer me? Yes, very possible. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. He gave us the example in the church of Ephesus. Okay. We were there 
Uh -huh. they, they, they left their first love, even though they were carrying out every all the activities, ceremony, uh -huh. every other thing. But the first love is gone. So, and a church that has the first love is gone. The light is gone. Light every is other gone. thing is ceremony. But in Ephesus, he said, if they don't repent, I will take out the light. So obviously, at that moment, he has not taken out the light. Yes. There's a church too in chapter 3. It's called the dead church. Revelation. Chapter 3, verses 1. I, the, I, and to the angel of the, of the church in Sardis writes the words of him who has the seven spirits, seven images again, and the seven stars. I know your works, your reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Please read that, read that for us in NLT. Chapter 1, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. They have a reputation as though they are alive, but they are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. And this is a church. Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Who wants to read that for us in NLT? It's a church. They have the reputation, the structure, organization. They have their big there, but they are dead. Revelation. Go ahead, sir. Verses 1 to what? 1 and 2. Verse 3, Abby. Chapter 3, yeah, verses chapter 1 and 2. Write this letter to the angel of the church of Sardis. This is the message from the one who are the sevenfold spirits of God and the seven stars. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You Wake know? up. Strengthen with, little, uh, strengthen with what little remains. For even what is left is almost dead. I find that your action do not meet the requirements of my God. My God. So it's very possible for a church to have organization, structure, they have money, but they are dead. Very possible. Very possible. Hence the need for us to know our Bible very well. So we can, you know, um, at the beginning of this book, we said the chapter one of this book is the ideal. In fact, the things we're going to be looking at from verses chapter one, verses 13, the things we'll be looking at are the problems of these seven church, no, five of them, two didn't have problem. Five of them. We'll be looking at the problems of these five churches from chapter 13 to the end. That's what we'll be looking at. The things that the Spirit told John were the things that God wanted these seven churches, these five, five of the seven churches to correct. Then when we go to chapter two and three, we'll now look at those things in details. But what, before we go away from chapter 1, verses 12, which says, he looked, uh, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. Seven golden lampstands, seven churches. And the church is referred to as light. There is no other worldview that reveals God like Christianity. There is no other religious worldview that reveal the truth of God like Christianity. There are two biggest religions apart from Christianity in the world, Islam and Hindu, Hinduism. Islam and Hinduism, the two biggest religions in the world. In Islam, when someone steals, Sharia says, cut off his hand. But if that God is a manufacturer, is the manufacturer of that hand, and that hand became deficient by stealing. What should the manufacturer do? It's like taking my car to Honda, Honda company, that my power steering is malfunctioning, and Honda said, cut it off, because I don't know how to fix it. And it really is a manufacturer, because if God of the Islam is actually God, and a hand still, you repair the hand. You don't cut it off. You repair the hand. They brought a woman in adultery to Jesus. He didn't say stone her. He fixed the woman. Peter doubted the Lord Jesus. He didn't stone him. He fixed him. Thomas, he fixed him. Because that is God. No other religion revealed the truth about God like the church. That's why the church is supposed to be light in this dark world. Second largest religion in the world, Hinduism. Hinduism believes in karma. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. They believe in reincarnation. 
So if a husband maltreats his wife and the husband dies, he comes back as a victim in the next world. Then the woman, the victim in this world comes as a victor in that other world. So if a husband maltreats his wife and he dies, he's going to come back as a woman. And that woman will come back as a man. And then the evil you emitted on the woman in this life, the woman will met it back on him in the next life. Is that not perpetration of evil? So how do we face the problem of evil? There's evil going on and going on, and there's no end to evil. Now, when, we, when you ask them, can you remember, do you have the memory of your prior life? They said no. So if you don't have the memory of your prior life, how then are you sure that you will not make the same mistake of your prior life? Stupid. It's stupid. It's a foolish religion. It doesn't make sense. But what does Christianity say? Justice is in the hand of God. And he has put all that on Christ. In Christ. On Christ. He has put all our justice requirements for our sin on Christ. The church is supposed to be light as this text suggests, or as this text is not suggesting, is saying to us right now, the church is supposed to be light. That's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. He said, let your light so shine. In fact, let me, let me disapprove some people who believe in the kingdom theology right now. Matthew 5, 13, you are the salt of the, salt of the head, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it season? How shall it be seasoned? It, it, it is then good for nothing, but to be thrown out and trampled under by underfoot by men. Salt preserves, but salt does not preserve forever. People will think they can change this world. Oh, we we are world changer. You can't change anything. The church can slow down the decay process, but the church cannot totally eliminate the decay process. If you put salt in, in meat, of course, it will slow down the decay, but it doesn't mean that this meat can be preserved for 100 years. It will preserve the meat for a while. And after a while, it will still get de it will still decompose. So we are the sort of the head, but we are not we are not here to repair the head permanently. But where I'm going is verses 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp, remember, lamp stand, and put it under a basket, but on a lamp stand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. God, God, that is why the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts. That is why the Holy Spirit put gifts into the body of Christ. So that through us, God will be revealed. So when the text that we are reading in Revelation says, the church is the lampstand, truly is a lampstand. The church is supposed to be a lampstand to this dark world. But let me ask some, some, some funny questions here. It says, let your light so shine. Let You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15 says, no, do they light a lamp and put it under a basket? And a lamp. A lamp, Atupa, light a city. And also light the world. How? How can and a light, a lamp, light a city? This is not street light here. This is not street light. This is not halogen light. How can a lamp? So let's flash back to back home. If you go to the village at night, there's no street light, no flood light. But somehow, you see, there are some lights they put at the front of houses, powered by kerosene in a lamp. You will not see very well. It's not clear. But that tells you that, one, they are awake in that street. So when you see lights like that, you know that it's not, too, it's, not uh, it's safe to move around. And one light, one house, one lamp, next house, one lamp, next house, one lamp, it creates a diffusion. In electricity, we call it X to X. It creates a diffusion. It's just one lamp here, one lamp there. It creates a kind of translucent view that tells you that that street is safe. It doesn't mean that you may not further in the gutter, 
But you can see that these people are awake. People are living in that place. There are people there. If you look at a cross-section view, like the mountain view of that street in that village, you'll find little light, 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 little light. So how this lamp of the church will empower a city is not coming very big. It's coming small, one house at a time. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, and that light can light a city, and that light can light a world, our world. That small lamp lantern from one family to the next family to the next family. So how is the next family going to be light lighted? I take my lamp and I give it to them. They lit their own. The next one takes their lamp and gives the next one and they lit their own. So from one match, one match in one house, you can use that to light uncountable houses in one night. One lamp. And that's the nature of the church. One light. One person. Like in this fellowship. We've been studying, we've studied John, lightening ourselves. We've studied James, studying, studied um, uh, Job, Ruth, Joshua. Today, we find Sister Francisca lightening some children as well. Do you see? Let, let your light so shine. One person is lighted, and that one person is lighting another person, and another person is lightening another person, and on and on like that. This is how the light of the church is supposed to spread. And that was how the Holy Church spread as well. It didn't spread with the campaigns that we are doing today. We call it crusade, the whole big crusade. No, it's one person at a time. Paul went to Ephesus. When he got to Ephesus chapter 19 of the book of Acts, he found 12 disciples. He discipled those 12. From there, they moved to a class. From a class, they moved to a hall. From a hall, they took over the city. From the city, today we are looking at the effect of Paul's journey to Ephesus. From Ephesus, it went to Ty Smyrna, Tyretra, Pagamos, Philadelphia, Laodicea. From one journey. From one poor, one poor, 12 disciples, Acts 19. And it see, this is how the light is being lighted. Question. If a church is supposed to be light, why is there so much darkness in our land? Yet we have so much churches. Question. Who wants to answer? If the church is supposed to be light, why... Why are there so much darkness in our land? And yet, there are so many churches. Who wants to answer? Um, I can just say something. Go ahead, ma. Yeah, why there's so much darkness in the midst of so many churches that's meant supposed to be the light that lightens the world. Like you said, the, the, the church of Christ is supposed to light, to be the light in the darkness of the world. But I remember a scripture that says, um, uh, it's come off my head now, <laughs> that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, which is the truth of the word of God. And the word of God is, is light. The word of God is Christ. But as long as the truth of this word is not going around, then people remain in their darkness, even though they can claim that they are, they, they, they've known Jesus, they receive salvation or they know Christ or do all the activities. But as long as the word is not there, because it's the word that changes one, is the truth of the word of the gospel that I heard that changed me from where I was worshiping to come to the truth of the knowledge today. Even though I was there for like 17 years in darkness, thinking that I know the truth. So I believe is the word of God that changes the heart of men. And if this word is not being impacted to the life of those who are in churches, they don't know the 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 foundation of that world. Then it's so hard for for light to come into the world. So we have so many darkness, so many churches, but a lot of them are still in darkness. They don't know the truth of what it is or, uh, to be uh, to be saved, or the truth of what Christ have actually done for us. Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. Any other person? One more person. Okay, so let's move on. Thank you, Sister Ajiri. You've, you've answered the question. And that takes us to the next point in the in our studies in the book of Revelation. I think I've overflogged chapter 1, verses 12. I need to move because so much, so much in this chapter, so much to, 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 to talk about. 
In chapter 1, verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstand. And the church, that lampstand is substituting the word church as for lampstand. But if you go to verses 13, it's reiterated something. It said, and in the midst of the lampstand. So in verses 13, I'm going to break it into three. The lampstand, like the son of man, and clothed with a long robe. I'm going to break it into three, and I'll take just three, one at a time. Verse 13 is uh, repeated the lampstand. And, and I want us to pay attention again. I want us to look and zoom down, zoom in into that word lampstand. The same word was used in chapter verses 12. And I turned, I saw the one, uh, I, I saw seven golden lampstand. Again, verses 13, and in the midst of the lampstand. The church is not the light. That sounds like, like a contradiction. It didn't say, then I saw the light. It said, I saw the lamp stand. The church, I, I once said, the church is supposed to shine as a light. Well, yeah, I want us to zoom to that word again, lamp stand. It didn't say the church is the light. It said the church is the light. It's calling them lamp stand. And that betrays what Sister I did have said right now. The church carries the light. Christ is the light. So when they, there's a place called church and their focus is not on Christ, the church is not there. John chapter 1. The church is not the light, but the carrier. They are the lampstand. Where's the light? John chapter 1 verses 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the and he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The man came to bear witness to the man came to bear witness, to bear witness of the light that through him that through him might believe. That through him. All might believe he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness to that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Jesus is being described here as the light. The church is not Jesus. The church is the people of God, blood-washed people. And their job is supposed to bear the message, the gospel of Christ, to shine the light of Christ. Wherever the light of Christ is being shine, is being shown, there will be no darkness. Truth will set people free. So the question I asked: why, How come our land is so dark? Yet we have so much churches because they are so much churches, but they are dead because what they are shining is not Christ. Are you looking for a true church? Look for a church that focus on Christ, not even on Holy Spirit, on the Holy Spirit, because we were never asked to focus on the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said, the Spirit will focus on him, will point us to him. You're looking for a very spiritual church, look for a church that focuses on the true Christ. We're going to be looking at the description of the true Christ as we move forward. The description of the true Christ. Christ is that light. The church is just a lamp stand that shines Christ. There should be no other thing that a church is supposed to be shining other than Christ. That is how you will know a true church. And then God will now use that church, those people, to reveal himself to this world. That is how the light of God shines to this world. If you look at worldviews, political worldviews, ideological beliefs, economic theories, economic theories, the most flourishing countries in the world, they may not be Christians, but they are established on Christianity principles. The most flourishing nations of the world are established on Christianity principles. The fathers knew something and they built their countries around those things they know. 
and they are the most flourishing countries on earth today. There was a woman called Mary Slesso, a Presbyterian woman who came to Nigeria. Let's see something about her. I don't know if you must have read about me. This is Mary Slesso. This is Mary Slesso. If you have not seen her before, this is Mary Slesso. Someone shining the light of God. She was a, a factory girl in her homeland. But then she joined the missionary and uh, she came to Calabar in Nigeria. She was born in December 2, 1848 in Aberdeen, Scotland. And died in 1915, 13th of January 1915 at the age of 66, died of malaria in Nigeria. Now, this woman, woman, a woman, can you imagine? No weapon. But the only thing in her mouth was the gospel. And she came to that area and she was able to abolish the killing of twins. Because at that point, twins in that region of Nigeria were viewed as uh, gods or things that are detestable. So they killed twins. Slesor saved hundreds of twins who had been left in the bush to die. This woman in that region. I have the book. I have a book about her. It, it was a dreadful area. Entering the village at the gate of the at the entrance of the village is a skull that welcomes you. See, that was how threatening and fearful that place was. But a woman, I love that. God is great. A woman with the gospel in her mouth, extinguished that, uh, inflamed that light. And she was able to stop that darkness with a woman, a woman with a gospel in her mouth. May this lesson, let's look at her face again. God, God saves a people. And through those people he has saved, hence reveal himself to this dark world. But today we find oppression, subjection in the so-called church of today, to the point that they use 48 laws of power to run church, and they are proud about it. They are proud of it now. They don't even keep that book. It's, it was referenced to me in the church. It's part of the books you have to buy as a pastor. You know how to control people. You know how to manipulate people in the church of today. The church is supposed to be light. And we are not the light. We are the carrier of the light. Christ is the light. Mm -hmm. So you're looking for a church that Christ is reigning supreme. Look for a church that focuses on Christ. Some of us don't, some of us know this. Why some people need to hear this. That's why I'm reemphasizing this. We move to verses 13. And verses 13 says, in, And in the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man. John saw something in the midst of the lampstand, which means in the midst of the church. In the midst of the church. There's a Phanaya 3.17, the Lord that God is strong, is mighty in your midst. And that's the name of Jesus, isn't it? Isn't it? Matthew, Matthew 1.21, his name shall be called God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. And that also points to us that when the believers are together, brothers and sisters, it's a very spiritual moment. When believers come together, it's not a social gathering. We don't come for plat party. It's not a club. But today, the church of today is structured like a club, like a social gathering. There's a church in Abuja. You come in, they give you sweet candy at the entrance. Everybody picks a candy. That give you a warm experience. So when you come back, that's just marketing. The church of Christ does not need our help. Because God that needs the help of man to be God is not God. The church of Christ is Christ's church. John saw Christ in the midst of the lampstand, which tells portrays what Hebrew told us. We have not come to a mountain that can be touched. 
We have come to God. We have come to the church of the firstborn. We have come to the immutable company of angels. We have come to the assembly of the firstborn. When we come together, forget the building. When born again people come together, something great, greater than great, greater than greatness is happening in their midst. And that is Christ himself is in their midst. Zephaniah 3, 17, the Lord thy God is mighty in the midst of thee. And that's what John saw here. In the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man. What does that word son of man mean? Or let me ask this question again. What's the difference between son of God and son of man? Who wants to answer? What's the difference? Between son of God and son of man. What's the difference? Are there any difference between son of God and son of man? Who wants to answer us? Too much question today. Already the third question. Who wants to give an attempt? Make an attempt. Son of God and son of man. I want to be sure we are all here. Anyone? Can I try? Go ahead, Dr. Francisca. <laughs> think son of God because he's the only begotten of God as the scripture says he came from the father and he, he existed before any creation uh, in the beginning was the word that's why he's the son of God and son of man because he was born of a woman even though mm. he's son of God thank you uh, the seed the seed that will that will um crush the head of Satan it will come from a woman. You are correct. We have answered the two questions. And where you find it together in the text, in the Bible, you find it together. Yes, it's, it's in several places. You find it in Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Then, verse 16, Peter said, Simon Peter answered and said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. The two in one text. The son of God means divine origin. The son of man means man origin. So son of man is an euphemism, another word for human being. Son of man, human being. Son of God, deity. For what reason was he about to be stoned? For calling himself the son of God. John chapter 10, verses 29 to 33. He called himself the son of God. The Jew understood the implication. When you say you are the son of God, that means what produced you, like San Francisco has said, the seed that produced you is divine in origin. And one is divine in origin, that means you are making yourself equal with God. That was why they wanted to stone him. So, when, when the text here says, one like a son of man, is seen an imagery that looked like the Jesus they know. John saw an imagery of the Son of Man, Jesus. He didn't say he saw Jesus. He saw one like. He saw an imagery that looked like the Jesus they know, Son of Man. And that's where we are going to be moving to Daniel. We read Daniel at the beginning of this conversation. But in, the, in, in John's description of this Son of Man, he said, in chapter 1, verses 13, in the midst of the lampstand, one like the, a son of man, clothed with long robe and with golden sash around his chest, his ears, the hair of his head were white. So there are two conflicting views here. You remember in chapter 1, this chapter 1, John, who bore witness to the word of God, verse 2, and to the testimony of Jesus. They were high witness. John, John and all the apostles gave us the eyewitness account of the resurrected Christ. And the, resurrect, the Christ that came at that point was the son of man as a human being because he came through Mary, like Sister Francesca said. At the same time, he's still the son of God because he is man and God at the same time. But what John is describing here is describing the two views of Christ. One like son of man but at the same time, they say, he's clothed with a long robe and white golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white. So, wait, 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 wait. What I am saying look like the Jesus we know. At the same time, he's looking like something else. Daniel chapter 7. That was why we read Daniel in conjunction with this one, with Revelation. Daniel chapter 7, 
verses 9. I watched till I watched till thrones were put in place, and the ancient of days were seated. This is Daniel describing the ancient of days. His garment was as white, his, his garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. Let's come back to Revelation. In the midst of the lampstand, one like the Son of Man, clothed with long robe and with golden such around his chest. His ears, the ears of his head were white like wool, white wool like snow. His eyes were like flame, flame of fire. But the description that John is giving to the Son of Man here is the description Daniel gave to the ancient of days in Daniel chapter 9. I watched till thrones were put in place and the ancient of days were seated. Ancient of days was seated. His garment was as white and the hair of his head were like pure wool. A fairy team issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. This is, this is another word for a lot of people. Crowd ministered to the ancient of days. Verses 13 says, I watched in the night vision and behold, one like the son of man coming with the cloud of heaven. He came to the ancient of days. Do you understand? There are two people here. Two entities here. There is the ancient of days that crowd, crowd upon crowd are worshipping. And he's dressed in white. His ear is as white as snow. But that description of what Daniel is giving to the ancient of days is what John is giving to the son of man. And when the son of man came in Daniel, then to him, this is the son of man. The son of man came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to put him, then to him was given dominion. Who? The son of man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Wait. Chapter 7, chapter 7, verses 10 of Daniel says, thousands of thousands worship the ancient of days. But again, Daniel is saying that Again, all people, all nations are worshipping the Son of Man. What is that telling us? John is making an allusion to this dialogue in Daniel, which means the true Christ, the true Christ is both God and man when he was on earth. So John is giving us a description of the true Christ. The true Christ is not like us. The Son of Man has the attribute of the ancient of days. That tells that the Son of Man is God, which is in connection, is in consonant with other parts of the Bible. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He's also giving us this Trinitarian view of who God is. Our God is one but not one. Our God is one. God is one. But then, if you look at it carefully, you find the ancient of this and the Son of Man came to the ancient of this. That is the truth about God. The church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth. This is the ideal that John is pointing to us. The church is the custodian of the light of God. John and uh, First Timothy chapter 3, verses 15. This truth is only peculiar to the church. First Timothy 3 15. It says, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. What is that truth? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What is that mystery? God was manifest in the flesh. Son of man, son of God became the son of man. This truth is supposed to be 
in the church. So what is the true Christ? I, I said in chapter verses 12 and for Revelation 1, 12, that the church is supposed to carry the light. And what is the light? Christ. And what is the Christ? The true Christ is not just our brother. The true Christ is not our rival. The true Christ is not our competitor. The true Christ is God incarnate. But when we look at churches today, they don't see it that way. The only thing they see about Christ is in Jesus' name. No honor of Christ. No respect for Christ. They even scam people in the name of Christ. Looking for the true church. Look for the church that teaches the truth about Christ. If the true church knows the truth about Christ, they will be afraid to use his name anyhow. They will be afraid to use his name in vain. The true Christ is both son of man and son of God, or both son of God and son of man. And that was what John saw. He saw someone in chapter 1 of verses 13, in the midst of the lampstand, but it's now having the attribute of the ancient of days because it's God. God became man, Emmanuel, God with us. The true church must teach the truth of Christ truthfully. John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 2. 1 John 4, start from verses 1 and 2. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you may know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is of God. Every spirit that confesses, the person who, who claims to be speaking by the Holy Spirit, we speak the truth about Christ. And the truth about Christ is that we are not his competitors. We are not his rival. And his name is not a, and his name is not a stamp to fulfill our selfish desire. The truth about Christ. His name is not a stamp to fulfill our selfish desire. So John saw that in the midst of the candle, lampstand, saw the Son of Man. And this Son of Man is quoted in long robe, attribute of ancient of days. Now, let's talk about that long robe. What does that long robe stand for? Why is it clothed in, in, in long robe? For what? For what purpose was it he, was he clothed in long robe? Now, that takes us to the next truth about Christ. That long robe, how do we explain that? So you have to go to Exodus 28, verses 4. The book of Revelation is an index book. It will take you to every part of the Bible. Revelation 28, let us look at how the priests are dressed in the Old Testament. 28 verse 4, 25 verse, 28 verse 4, 29 verse 5. Well, let me just pick 28 verse 4. In 28 verse 4, and these are the garments which they shall make. This is talking about the garment of the priesthood, the garment for the priesthood. These are the garments which they, which they shall make, a breastplate, an effort, a robe, a skin, Carefully woven tunis, tunis, a turban and a sash. A sash is like uh, something that is wrapped around the waist. Now let's look at Revelation. And in the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest, is dressed. The imagery John saw is the son of man, human being, Jesus Christ. Dressed like the high priest. And that's it. Jesus is our high priest. The church, the true church, must preach, must speak the truth about the true Christ. The true Christ is our high priest. What was the function of the Old Testament high priest? The Old Testament high priest functioned as an intercessor. 
a link between man and God. They are the ones that goes to offer the blood uh, uh, blood sacrifice on the altar. The, the high priest goes inside into the holies of holies on behalf of the people. The people can go there. Anyone that goes there is going to die. But the high priest takes the sin of the people and brings blessing from God to the people. The high priest takes the sin of the people to God and bring blessing from God to the people. So the high priest served as a conduit between God and man. And the true church, our, our link between God, our link to God is Christ. First Timothy 2, 5. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That tells you that the Catholic church is a fraud because they have a lot of links between people and God. It could be Saint, it could be Mary. Now let's talk about Mary. If Babayede is my dad and Bodaero needs something from me and he goes to Baba to tell Baba to tell me that, Baba, please let me tell Paul to give me this thing. And Bodaero calls himself my friend. But to get me, you have to go through my father. That means we are not friends. We don't have a relationship. That means we are not friends. On the other hand, I was driving on the highway and I had a speed ticket. But I will go to the judge and tell you, I know the mother of the judge. I will tell your mother to, to talk to you. That's corruption. Isn't it? In that case, then you look at it, the Catholic Church is a fraud. Because they put layers. But then, don't go too far. Is that not the church we have today? The church we have today also puts layers. But the vision, the imagery John is seeing is that Christ is the high priest. He's the one wearing the robe of the high priest. There is no more high priest again. Redeem sent a circular recently to the North American church and they said all offering and tithe must go to the office of the high priest. And who is the high priest? Geo. No. He can't be the high priest. Christ is the high priest. He's the one that takes us to God with his own blood. It's in this revelation, chapter 1, verses 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the, of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to, who, to, to him who loved us and freed us with, from our sin by his blood. He's the one that free us. So instead of looking, instead of taking our sin with the blood of God, it takes our sin with his own blood to God and it brings blessing to us. Ephesians 2.18. Ephesians 2 18, we have access. We all have access to God by the Spirit because of what Christ has done. But in this, in this book of Revelation, something is about to happen. If, if, when you get to chapter 2, you will find the doctrine of the, local, of the Nicolaitans. Chapter 2, verses 6. And yet, this you have. You have you ate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also ate. I will explain that when we get to chapter 2 and chapter 3, verses 15. We will see the works, is it 3, 15, 2, 18 or something? We will see the works of the Nicolaitans. The works of the Nicolaitan, in, in summary, in summary, is a link, layers between God and man. True church don't put layers between God and man, brothers and sisters. True church does not put layers. Okay, okay chapter 2, verses 15. You'll find that in chapter 2, verses 6, chapter 2, verses 15, the doctrines of the Nicolaitan. It put layers. You connect with God through this book. You connect with God through this water. You connect with God through this oil. You connect with God through this mantle. Layers. Brothers and sisters, the imagery of what John saw is an imagery of Jesus, who is the high priest. Let's move to verses 14. Wow. Time. The hairs of his head were white, like wool, like snow, his eyes were like flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. Let me crush that down because we're coming to an end now. Let me crush that. Um, the hairs of his head were like, verses 14, the hairs of his head were like, were like white, just like the ancient of days in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, Daniel 7, verses um. Let me see where I start. Where that is. Daniel 7. Yeah, okay. Daniel 7, verses 9. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the ancient of this was seated. His garment was 
white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. Revelation chapter 1, verses 14. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like flame of fire. You find what we see in Daniel 7, tallies with Daniel 7, 9, tallies with what we are looking at in Revelation 1, 13, and 14. What Daniel John is saying here is a description of the Son of Man. What Daniel is seeing here is the description of the ancient of these brothers and sisters. Our God is one, but in three persons. But then, what is it? What is why ear? Why white ear? The hairs of his head were white, like wool. What does that mean? When we see a human being that has gray hair, that means old age. So what is this pointing our attention to? This is pointing our attention to this person Daniel saw and done. Daniel saw and done, so also seen here, is hold, older than every one of us. That's why they call him the ancient of this. And if he's the ancient of this, then he must be very wise. Because literally speaking, not in all cases, but most of the time, Age and wisdom goes together because wisdom is for is summary of life experiences, right? Now, who will be more wiser? The seven churches or the ancient of this? Who has been before time began? And who will be after time? Who will be more wiser? The ancient of this. So what this text is pointing our attention to is that what John is seeing in this vision is seeing great wisdom. Perhaps, why is God showing this vision to Daniel and is pointing his attention to great wisdom because there are things that will happen in the five churches that man began to run church of Christ with their own wisdom. Man will begin to run church with their own subjective human reasoning. They left the ancient of days, ancient of days, the all-wise God, the all-knowing God, who is in the midst of his church, and they began to run church with their own speculative human reasoning. As a result of that, their light was no more. And we shall see that when we go to the next chapter. See the doctrine of Tari. You see the deeper, deeper truth, Revelation 2.24. You see the uh, Revelation 2.15, the doctrine of Jezebel. They left the wisdom of God. But still, who is the wisdom of God? Christ is the wisdom and the power of God. And if Christ is the wisdom and the power of God and is the head of the church, well, then the church is supposed to be operated as the head of the church want the church to be operated. Time is fast spent. I really wish I spent more time on that, but I want to wrap up. I want to wrap up with verses 14 and verses 15. Verses 14, the B part says, His eyes were like flame of fire. Many of us like to, many of us not like, many of us hear a lot of churches, this, this, and fire ministries. Or you see people saying fire, you know, all this over emphasis on fire. There's, a, there's this, uh, as though it's a good thing to call fire. As though I'm, I'm, I'm on fire. This church is on fire. This, this is fire. Fire, fire. What does that word fire? Why? How do you... Is it really a good word to be used in the church? To say, to mean that I'm in the spirit or I'm... I'm, I'm. Let's look at it together. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. This combination is not a good combination. No. This combination is a combination for judgment. It's not a good word. Jesus will, do, he will baptize with Holy Ghost and fire, but not at the same time. For those who are born again, we will be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For those who are not born again, we will be baptized with fire. To be baptized means to be dipped, submerged. Fire is judgment. All through the Old Testament, uh, Abiu and his brother offered wrong sacrifice. The fire consumed them. The children that were uh, heirs 
sent 50 messengers to go and force Elijah to come. Fire consumed them. Fire consumed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a metaphor for judgment. But these are the words we hear today. Oh, fire. And can you go on fire ministry? Fire this, fire that. Fire is not a good word that should be used in the church age. Am I making that up? Next chapter. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18. This this is to the church of Tyre, the church in Tyretra, to the church in Tyretra, and to the angel of the church in Tyretra, write the word of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire. Whenever when we get to the churches, I will explain the first line that John will write is the problem and judgment upon that particular church. So to the angel of the church in territory, the word of the Son of, Ma of God, who has eyes like flame of fire, the same thing, I've said it in chapter one, those things that John listed were the ideal, were the things that will be explained, that will be explained. They were enumerated in chapter one, they will be explained in chapter two and chapter three. Who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. This is not a good word to territory because territory had gone into False teaching. Look at verse uh, um, I gave her time to repent. Verse 21. But she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. Verse 20. But I have this against you that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servant to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idol. This is the practice going on in Tanitra. And what did Jesus bring? He brought fire, which is judgment. I give her time to repent. But she refused to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her into, the, into a sick bed. I will throw her into a sick bed. And those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. Let's stop there. Tanitra was practicing a false doctrine. And what Jesus brought to that church was fire to judge them. Eyes of fire, leg like bronze. I, can't, I don't have time to open that in the Old Testament. How that is applicable. Well, what, am I, what are we seeing here as we wrap up? We are seeing, what we are seeing here is that Jesus does not condone false doctrine in his church. Tarechra went into false doctrine and he brought fire. To judge them if they don't repent. So true church of Christ does not celebrate false doctrine. Okay, Baba just teaches the truth, but it mingles with false prophets, false teachers, false pastors. They are all the same. If truly we belong to Christ, we cannot mingle with false teaching because Christ is not happy with false teaching. That's what John is seeing here in this vision, chapter one. He's seeing a Christ whose eyes is like fire. He's seen a Christ who is ready to bring judgment on Tyretra because they are taking God's people to practice idolatry, false doctrine, false teaching. It's in that chapter we find deeper truth, depth of Satan. They had brought depth of Satan to that church and the owner of the church is not smiling. He's about to judge. We will see that in chapter 2 by God's grace. Finally, brothers and sisters, we don't turn to God with idol. We turn to God from idol. Oh, maybe I'll get I will start with that next week because time is far spent today. But I want to end. And then let's 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 bring it on end. This John, when he saw this Christ, when I saw him, verse 17, I fell at his feet as though dead. People claim they are seeing Jesus today. I had someone, Arume, what's his name? Oh, Jesus came to me and told me, you see, did you see me? I calm the storm because I know who I am. If you know who you are, you too can speak to things. Nonsense. The right to respond to the true Jesus, who is the ancient of this, the, uh, the wisdom and the power of God, <laughs> is not your party. Jesus in the manger is gone. Jesus in the manger is gone. Jesus at the, in Jerusalem is gone. Jesus in the temple is gone. The Jesus now is a resurrected Christ. 
Daniel says, then to him was given dominion. Did Jesus now the glory and glory and kingdom that all people, nation, and language should serve him? It's not the Jesus we command here and there. The true Jesus of the Bible is not Jesus we can give dictation to. Do this in Jesus' name. Do that in Jesus' name. The true Jesus of the Bible, the right response is worship, is adoration, is dominion, is praises. When I saw him, I fell. That is it. Everyone that had a counter with the true Jesus don't stand before Paul. Acts 9. Peter said, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Isaiah 6 said, I am a man of an unclean lips. I am done. True Jesus of the Bible. People that have a counter with him don't stand before and this Jesus and John fell at his feet as though, they, as, though, as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the first. But brothers and sisters, pay attention and look at this properly. This Jesus had this touch, the seven stars in his hand. And this same Jesus came to touch. He had the seven stars in his right hand. And this same Jesus came to touch John with that same hand. Is he going to drop the seven stars to touch John? Or will he touch John with the same time, at the same time that he's holding the seven stars? So is this a logical question for a human being? He had seven stars in his hand, in his right hand. And that same right hand is touching John. How come the seven stars did not fall while he was touching John? It's a human being. We can't do two at the same time. But it's God. His hand is big enough to accommodate all of us. I stop with John chapter 10. And where we stop, we'll continue from next week. I thought we were going to finish this thing today. But I can't. I can't. Because this world is overwhelming. John chapter 10. Let's look at the hand of God. Then we pray. And we'll stop there. I thought we were going to finish. John chapter 10, verses 27. My sheep. Hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Not hands, hand, one hand. And yet that one hand is big enough to keep all of us. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my father are one. I'm fascinated by the truth of the true Christ. Because it's good. I remember last week we, saw, we spoke about John, who was banished in the island of Patmos alone. How comforting would it be to him for the hand of God to touch him? That's the greatest of all comfort. And that hand was holding seven stars. At the same time, the right hand was touching John and the seven stars does not have to fall down. He doesn't have to throw them away to touch John. He's able to keep all of us in the same hand and none of us can fall. And he said, nobody can snatch us from his hand. The true church, Christ is in the midst of the true church. The true church is also secured in the hand of Christ. Perhaps why this thing happened, was for God to let John know, you may have been banished as a leader of the church, but my true church is secured in my hand. And we shall see as we move in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that the church looked like it was going down. But see, you and I today talking about the Jesus we never met because the true church will be secured. God has loved the true church before eternity and that love will last into eternity. Let us pray. But before we pray, let us and dear brothers and sisters in Christ. The revelation we have studied today in chapter 1, verse 16. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. We're going to start from there next week, by God's grace. But on a closer look, Jesus hold the church in his hand, and the church leader in his hand, and out of his mouth comes the double-edged sword. That's how Christ speaks to his church. You're looking for a church 
where Christ is speaking. Look for a church where the word of God is not just being preached, but preached and practiced. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the assurance of your word. Thank you for the hope and confidence that comes from knowing you. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for teaching us your word. Truly, your word is power. Your word is spirit. Your word is truth. Your word set free. Your word liberates. Father, grant that by the power of the spirit, we'll continue to grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please continue to walk in us. Separate us from the world. Things that is not of you, that is in us. We ask that you keep washing us by the spirit. Keep washing us by the washing of your word. Pray, Lord, that this teaching will cause us to fall in love with our Lord Jesus more. And this teaching will cause us to respond the right way to our Lord Jesus. Cause us to worship. Bow down. Worship the spirit and the truth. Thank you, Lord, for those who have shown up today. And we pray for those who will listen to this teaching again this week or whenever before you come. Grant that the truth of Christ will be revealed to all of us in a way that only your spirit can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. Uh... We thank God for releasing the power of his word into our lives. Um, let me just, let me just uh, make a little bit of a comment. And uh, that's of the son of man and, uh, uh, you know, Daniel 7, son of man and things like that. Um, and actually, uh, we want to know what the Jews understand. How do, do they understand Daniel 7? That's that's most important thing, and uh, the putting together of that Daniel seven because in Daniel seven you see like in uh, verse thirteen about it it looks like a uh, one of the like the son of man coming from the cloud of heaven came to the ancients of day so two people and they brought him nearer and verse fourteen is the most important part of that. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. You see, that statement, you, we, if we open to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 14, and we go through the questions that the high priest was asking Jesus at that time. Uh, from verse 60, we are there. So, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, do you answer nothing? What is this? What is it this man testify against you? You know, those guys were making testimony uh, about taking down the temple. But you need to understand verse 61. It says, but he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? But what is the Jesus' answer? Say, said, I am. Mm -hmm. And you will see the son of God sitting at the right hand of the power coming with the cloud of heaven. So if, if, you, if, if you take that one a, a minute and you go back to that Daniel 7, you will discover that Daniel 7, it was just pointing to Daniel 7. He said, I am Christ first. Then pointed to Daniel 7. You see, from the book of Isaiah, Christ is a messenger. It's a servant, my faithful servant. And the same thing, it looks like to them, there are two different things. But in that verse 14 of Daniel 7, that son of man became God because his uh, reign was from everlasting to everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting. That is his reign. 
He said, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. So they knew that there is ancient of day, there is this son of man, but they didn't really understand that one that they fused together. Mm. They didn't understand. And in that Mark 14, when Jesus answered, you see, look at the simple question. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus, you know, the son of the blessed to us will have been the, the highest. But he said, I am answering that. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the cloud of heaven. Same thing that we have in uh, Daniel. Daniel. Look at 63. And you know, when the Jews say that you have blasphemed, it means that you have called yourself God. Mm. Look, look at what he did. The high priest tore his clothes and said, what further need do we? Do we have of witness? You have had the blasphemy. Those things that they didn't really see is what John was seeing in uh, Revelation chapter 1. Here. Yeah. So they're not two different people. Yes, one. Uh, uh, what, what, what Daniel was explaining is that, listen, these two are one, fused together. Here. Yeah. Also, what they the, the way the Jews read Daniel 7 14 is that that is God. And look at this, look at this one that we are touching that is calling himself God. He <laughs> tore his clothes. And that's the confirmation that uh, Revelation is giving to us here. Yeah. It's giving to us that. So uh, you see what our, my brother has been saying since morning. It's revealing the attributes of God. It's revealing what God, the way, and what John, he said, John, John didn't stand up like that. He worshipped. And the Jews know that you shall not worship any other one. But God, they don't worship any other one. But when he saw this figure, he really worshipped. And um, uh, 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 like that verse 13, he said, it was, we are need long rope. Go to, go to Isaiah 6, chapter verse 1. Mm -hmm. Go to Isaiah 6 and verse 1. And you will see what Isaiah saw. He said, in the days, you know, Isaiah 6, chapter 1. He uh, said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. What about high and lifted up? How about his robe? Fill, you know, the, the train of his robe, fill the temple. First and sister, the resurrected Christ, the one that John saw, was God. Thank you. So if it's God, then it, 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 require, it requires worship, adoration, submission. And then when people put in, themselves in the place of Christ, they are committing blasphemy. Blasphemy. Let me just put this one, brother. You, you see Yahweh, Yahweh. When you see some people singing that one, know that they don't even actually know God because the Jews that have those things, they don't even call. That's why they call Adonai. They don't shout all those Yahweh, Yahweh things that we, are, we shout when we sing. Adonai. Because they, they don't think that anybody is worthy to call the covenant name of God. So we have to be very careful. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, sir. Any other contribution? Any other contribution? Okay. So we're going to stop the recording.